Let's talk about gravitation today. All of you know the equation F equals G M1 M2 upon R squared. Pretty straightforward. What I hope to do right now is not just make you see the science in it, but the beauty of it as well. Using just this law and the laws of motion, one can explain almost anything, right from how an apple falls from a tree to the formation of tides and even answer questions like why are planets spherical why does the moon go around the earth and not just fall into the earth why is the solar system almost planar and so on but in truth planet earth and the solar system is where the law of gravity just begins in outer space gravity is an artist of epic proportions painting on a canvas light years wide taking billions of years to create breathtaking masterpieces the formation and motion of these magnificent objects are governed by this very law one would expect a law that explains so many things accurately to be a little more complicated but that is the beauty of it the fact that nature and the universe follows such a simple and elegant law that can be said in a single line every point mass in the universe attracts every other point mass with a force whose magnitude is proportional to the product of their masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them so this law was not born overnight it all started in the year 1543 when copernicus proposed that the planets went around the sun but the belief of the time was that everything the planets the stars and the sun went around the earth as it gained popularity there was a lot of debate on which theory was right but a man named tycho brahe came up with a revolutionary idea to settle this debate he said instead of sitting and thinking about it why not just observe and see what they do now you might think that should have been the obvious first step but people then were different The practice of validating theories with observation was not common. So he spent his lifetime setting up an observatory and recording the positions of the planets and the stars and all this with the naked eye. The telescope wasn't even invented yet. Johannes Kepler, who was one of his contemporaries, went through this enormous amount of data and came up with a few interesting inferences. They are what we call Kepler's laws. Number 1, he settled the debate by observing that each planet moves in an elliptical orbit with the sun at one focus of the ellipse. Number 2, a line from the sun to a planet sweeps equal areas in equal times. Number 3, squares of time periods of revolution of planets are proportional to the lengths of the cubes of their semi-major axis of their orbits. Now I'll explain these laws in detail but for now let's continue with the story. Kepler's laws explained how the planets moved but did not talk about why the planets moved the way they did. In fact, the common theory was that they were pushed around by angels that were flying tangentially to the path of the planets. But Newton in 1680 figured out that there was something wrong with this idea. He was aware of the concept of inertia which was proposed by Galileo that suggested that a body would not change its state of motion unless an external force acted on it. He realized that the elliptical motion of the planets around the sun would be possible if instead of a tangential push there was a central pull. For example, in the case of a stone that is being flung around with a string, the tension is always toward the center and not in the direction of velocity. Similarly, he deduced that the planets were moving this way because the sun was constantly pulling them. The most important realization came when he saw the moons of Jupiter behave just like the planets. That is, they were going around Jupiter just like the planets went around the sun. He also saw the earth's moon went around the earth in a similar fashion. He figured this could be true only if the earth attracted the moon 
and Jupiter attracted its moons, just like how the Sun attracted the planets. And of course, finally, he understood that the reason an apple fell toward the Earth was because of this same force of attraction. And thus was born the idea that every point mass attracts every other point mass in the universe. Now using Tycho Brahe's observations, Kepler came up with or deduced a few results, which are generally called Kepler's laws. The first law was that he observed, he saw, that all the planets moved around the sun in elliptical orbits, right? In such a way that the sun was at one of the foci of those orbits. So the top view of the solar system would look like this. So the second law is that the planets move faster when they're close to the sun and are slower when they move further away from the sun. Now, the same law is sometimes restated in a different manner. Uh, it is said that the aerial velocities of the planets is always constant. Now, what does that mean exactly? Uh, for that, let's just take the example of a planet that's moving in an elliptical orbit like this. And let's say this is the sun over here. Now, let's take the case where, this, where the planet is close to the sun. Okay, now what is the area swept by this planet in, let's say, one day? Now, from in, a, in one day, let's say the planet moves from here to here. So the area swept will be this, right? So this, the area of this region is the area swept by the planet. Now, what the law says is that when, let's say, the planet comes to the other side, the area swept by the planet in the same time interval will be exactly the same. So for that to be true, the distance traversed by the planet has to be lesser, right? So that these two areas are exactly the same. So this implies that the distance traversed by the planet when it's close to the sun is greater and the distance traversed by the planet when it's further away from the sun is lesser in the same time interval. Or in other words, the speed of the planet is greater when it's close to the sun and it's lesser when it's further away from the sun. So the third law says that the square of the time period of any two planets is always proportional to the cube of their semi-major axis. Now, if that sounds confusing, let me just explain. Now, if I take a planet that's going around in, such, like in an orbit like this, the time period is obviously the time taken to complete one full revolution. Let's call it T. Now, what is the semi-major axis? For that, just consider the largest diameter. There is this and half that length is what we call the semi-major axis. Now let's call it R. Now what Kepler found was that T square is always proportional to R cube for any pair of planets. 